yes the recording has started uh anyone could you please lead in prayer dev prince kanan okay i'll pray yes dear Heavenly father we come before you we thank you lord god for this day again okay yes, we thank you that you have given us this opportunity once again to come to gather at at us and learn Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything what you have done um, for us last week and we pray that this week Lord, that you continue to do and care for each one of us and help each one of us to understand every word that we are about to learn Lord Jesus and help each one of us to obey and, and be someone who, who does what the word says, who does what what, what we listen and let each one of us um, be a person who obeys your word. Yes, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, we are going through uh, for second peter and we were in the last chapter there so today we'll uh, touch upon that and uh, i was thinking i would start jude uh, but i'll see maybe i'll start james and then come back to jude we'll we'll see how it goes so um, uh, let's go back to second peter chapter 3 So in the book of uh, Second Peter so far, we have seen that uh, Peter, uh, you know, uh, has that sense of encouragement for the believers. And he always seems to do that. He first starts off by encouraging them, remi reminding them that this world is but uh, temporary and uh, that we have a permanent place in heaven. So our inheritance is permanent. Uh, what what uh, the Lord Jesus has done in us is deeper than what the world has to offer. So in chapter one, we saw how he says, add to your faith. And then, you know, he, he uh, keeps saying, okay, you have all these uh, precious promises through which you can partake of the divine nature of God and uh, keep growing in, in uh, your faith, become stronger in God, develop all these godly qualities and everything. And then he suddenly changes his um, instruction to uh, warning about false apostles. And then he describes how false apostles are very uh, subtle, secretively they come in, they, they have destructive uh, heresies, which obviously they go against God's word. And when we follow them, they will destroy. They destroy the teacher as well as the listeners. So he's really warning the believers and saying, please don't get caught up in these things. So that's where we were. We saw the qualities of uh, such apostles who um, are for gain and for profit and benefit and not uh, thinking so much about the uh, spiritual growth of the listeners. Then, you know, we saw that they like popularity, they like fame. And uh, and so it's a very selfish and self-willed uh, attitude that these false apostles carry. Okay, so now coming to uh, chapter three, we had just started and over here, Again, you know, he uh, goes on to um, stir up the the believers by way of reminder. Uh, and, uh, you know, he says, okay, that you should remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And the commandment uh, of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So uh, it's really encouraging to note that you know somebody like peter who had been with jesus who is part of the apostles uh he is speaking to the uh the jew the listeners here now uh let's go forward from here and see what other things he has to say and we i think we touched on this as well he said in the last days there will be scoffers okay scoffers are those who uh will a mock or make fun of what has been said so we know that the lord jesus promised he said i'm going to come back i'm going to take those who believe in me with me so you know the the rapture the second coming and things like that so there are people uh, or these are uh, uh, 
you know part of those uh, um, false false uh, teachers and apostles and the people who are actually not following god he just puts them in one category and says scoffers you know they question they question they ask where is the promise of his coming okay where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation now you know this is uh, uh you could say that it it sounds very logical okay but then in the core of what is being said here there is unbelief there is a uh, um sort of competing against what god has spoken so it's not a sincere question where is the promise of his coming we can ask a sincere question when is he really coming you know uh, and and then search and try to find the answer that is one way that is the right heart with which we ask such a question but scoffers are those who mock so when they ask the question they ask with the attitude that we know it's not going to happen where is where is god where is his promise when is he going to return so you know the uh, the people who carry an attitude of pride they are self willed uh, and they are full of unbelief they question what the word of god itself says and then you know, he goes on he says they willfully forget that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water so you know, he brings our attention to the importance of the wo word of god and reminds the believers don't you know that the world itself was formed by the word of god so how is it that there are people with this kind of an attitude and a heart of unbelief who question the very word of god uh, and you know he goes on to say that you know by the word of god by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water so every occurrence on the earth has taken place because of the word of god and so the word of god has the power to create and here he's also referring to uh, the flood which actually uh, uh, destroyed the earth you know um, and so the word of god has both the power to create as well as to destroy if required but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word so you see it's amazing the word of god creates word of god also sustains so it says the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men so he also reminds the believers that there is coming a day when there will be judgment and not just the judgment of people you know whether they uh, accepted christ or not whether they lived their lives uh, by doing righteous acts that honor god but he also talks about the uh, uh, the effect of the judgment on the heavens and the earth so uh, that's also the creation of god the creation of god the living creation of god would be people but then god has also created a lot of other things heavens and the earth and even the heavens and the earth right so all this is going to be affected uh, on the day of judgment and you uh, notice that he is specifically pointing out and saying that ungodly men you know they will be judged on that day so it's a very very um uh, uh sort of um a, a thing to be cautious about alert about warned about that you know people will be judged for uh, their right as well as the wrong that they do now coming to verse 8 here but he says beloved do not forget this one thing that the law with the lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night so no 
he uh, once again makes a comparison to remind the believers that when mockers or scoffers ask the question, when is it going to be? In our calculation, it seems like God is taking a very long time. But we have to understand that God lives outside of time. So the, the days, the years, the months you know, that pass by, for us, it feels um, like God has forgotten about his promise and you know there is a delay but he says it's almost like if you ask an adult um, about a week that was spent generally an adult would say oh it was a quick week there was so much work to do and i was so busy and the week just went by monday to uh, uh, you know uh, by next sunday I didn't even realize. But if you ask a child, you know, for a child, it could feel like that one week is a very long time. And uh, let's say, you know, they have exams or they have holidays. They're able to um, feel or sense that the time is so long. So depending on who they are, the same length of time seems shorter or longer. And similarly, you know, he reminds us, look, for God, you know, a day is as a, a thousand years and a thousand years as a day so in god's calculation he is not delaying anything we are the ones in our perception who uh, uh, are wondering if the lord is taking very long uh, but god is faithful he will fulfill his word and again he refers to the day of judgment Many things we can learn about the day of judgment. You know, we uh, what is going to happen? Those who have gone against God, they are going to be judged. So it's a very scary time for them. And also now he says, it will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So few features he gives here it will come as a thief in the night or we don't know exactly when that day is going to be you know when judgment takes place so this is only in the knowledge of the lord for others a thief comes unannounced and that's why he uh, tries to describe it like that so when the lord you know his judgments all these things are going to take place it will be unknown to his creatures but you know god will still do it and then you know, he talks about the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up so he is talking about uh, uh, you know different different events that take place we know that the uh, the heavens and the earth are going to be renewed into the new heavens and the new earth and the destruction of the earth at that time it will take place through fire okay uh, and so all that he's referring to and he's saying look those days are coming again it's like he's tying this into what he talked of in uh, first peter chapter one where he said that in heaven we have um uh, in like uncorruptible inheritance those things cannot be destroyed but this world is temporary it is going to come to an end so in a sense uh, if you want to just tie it uh, into what we learned about false teachers and you know a false um, apostles we recognize that he's saying they think that their gains are going to last with them for a lifetime uh, but that's not a long period of time. What is really important for everyone to remember is that all this is going to come to an end and then there is judgment and we have to answer the Lord. We have to give an account for our lives. We have to, um, you know, stand before the Lord uh, and we better have done things the way God wants us to do. Now, coming here to verse 11. So he says, so now you understood that this world is temporary, judgment is coming, all that. Therefore, because of this, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, 
because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, you know, Peter's perspective is uh, throughout you, you see that he's saying, look, this world is temporal. Don't strive to accumulate in this world. Okay. Uh, now, we should not misunderstand that the Bible wants us to live a life where we are disconnected from the world. Uh, all of you are Bible college students. You have studied uh, various subjects uh, about history and philosophies. Um, and you know that in uh, Christian history, there have been groups that have preached that this world is not important. So don't worry. You know, you don't have to um, uh, do well in, in this life. Uh, what is the point of uh, being successful or having resources in this life? Uh, all these things don't matter because ultimately we're all going to go to heaven and that is our permanent place. So there are groups which have taken this truth to the extreme. But we know that what the Lord Jesus told us to do, even in John chapter 17, do you all remember? We studied the book of John together. He told that, you know, these, these people, Lord, these disciples whom you have given me, uh, uh, I'm not asking that you take them away from this world or don't take them out of this world, but you help them to live for you in this world. They're not of this world. But they are here as my representatives. And Jesus also did the same thing. He was also not of this world. Many times he said that, I'm not of this world. And imagine if he never came to the earth, we will be missing a huge portion of God's plan of redemption. And so us living on the earth is a very important thing. And we are here as overcomers. We are here as people who must... Uh, uh, and, you know, Jesus uh, says this, occupy till I come, which means that we are supposed to live our purpose and do our assignment uh, and uh, see an increase for the kingdom of God here on the earth. And we are not called to live a disconnected life. So we are here very much following the principles of God, doing well and also serving the kingdom of God. Okay. But we must carry an eternal perspective throughout. And that's the way we have to implement what we are studying. So don't ever say that, hey, this life is not important. We're all going to heaven. And that is what is, uh, uh, you know, uh, our focus. So that's not the interpretation of what we are saying. So now that he has emphasized eternal perspective and we have understood the correct way of understand, uh, uh, correct way of taking it, now, once again, you know what uh, Peter says here is, uh, this, uh, he says, because the world is temporary, everything will be dissolved. So have a godly life. Remember, that has also been his emphasis. He said that you are living in a world, though you had a life which, uh, you know, you were uh, partying and, you know, you were living uh, in sin. You were doing things that were pleasing your flesh. But now that you are in Christ Jesus, you have to partake of the divine nature of God. And the divine nature of God is a nature which is holy, uh, you know, which, which is uh, truthful, which is godly, all those things. So the life and the character of the believer must also be godly. That's so important. And again, you know, his emphasis here, you ought to be or ought is a way of saying you must be. It's not an option. You ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. So that simply means if I call myself a believer, I should be a godly person. I should be a God-fearing person. If I'm not a God-fearing person and if I call myself a believer and I'm living my life however I like, that is not biblical. Okay. Now moving forward. One more thing he says that, okay, now that we understood that this world is passing away, Another important thing we should carry in our hearts is we must be eager about the return of the Lord Jesus. So yes, there are phrases like thief in the night. It will Jesus will come like a thief in the night. You know, all these uh, ways of explaining 
the second coming and the return of the Lord Jesus uh, are there in the Bible. But for a believer, we need a sense of readiness. Do you remember the, the parable of the ten virgins where we are told that Jesus will come back and that is very certain. So the foolish virgins, what did they do? They were not ready. But the wise virgins, they were ready with the oil for the lamp. And that is nothing but oil of intimacy. They had developed, strengthened their relationship with the Lord and they were waiting that, okay, Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back. So it's a, it's a heart which is eager and waiting for the bridegroom. Does a bride um, regret and is she upset that the bridegroom is going to come, you know, when they're going to get married? No. In fact, she's eager and waiting. And we as the church, we are the bride of Christ. And so what should be our attitude? Our attitude should be that we are excited. We are looking for Jesus. And so this thief in the night, when the thief comes, we don't know. Hey, when did he come? You know, that's the way people uh, are surprised by a thief coming. But for a believer, the return of the Lord Jesus should not be a surprise. Exactly when is he coming? We don't know. Because that is something only God knows. And Jesus said that only the Father knows the time of his return. But then we as his bride, the church, is expectant. We know he is going to come. He is going to come. I have to be ready. I have to be prepared. So on and so forth. You know, that's the attitude we must carry. And so even when you read the books of, you know, First and Second Thessalonians, Paul writes to the uh, believers and says, be eager that your savior is going to return. So when you look at the first century church, you know, they did not have an understanding of the timelines. Um, maybe through revelation, some of them understood, but you know, all of them expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. That is how they have lived. And when did Peter write this? You know, Peter also wrote, uh, we said somewhere around 60 AD. Okay, that's when Peter wrote this uh, um, epistle. Even at that time, he is telling the believers, Jesus can come back anytime, be ready. So their expectation was that Jesus will come back in their lifetime. So they live their lives with that kind of an eagerness. So you imagine how much more we as believers should know, we should be prepared, we should be excited that Jesus is going to come back. Uh, and so when scoffers or people who ask, ask the question, oh really, is he coming back? You know, when people ask a question like that, uh, we are we feel the pain. That What is it? You know, people are not understanding God's word is so real. The world was formed by his word. The world was sust is sustained by his word. And he has spoken that he's going to come back. He is going to come back. We are waiting for him to come back. And then, you know, all the other details, you know, every part of what we are reading, if you go into the depths of it, it's so amazing. It says heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. You know, sometimes I wonder as a, uh, you know, um, like a science student, I wonder why Lord uh, earlier God destroyed with a flood. Why is he just going to destroy with fire? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's going to take, you know, high temperatures to, um, there are some elements in the earth, which it's very difficult to melt those metals and, you know, substances. Only God knows how this world can be renewed. And maybe that is why scriptures say that there is going to be a fire being on fire, everything will be dissolved and uh, God is going to recreate or he is going to renew uh, the earth and the heavens. So his promise is true. So finally, the end of verse 13, he says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So what is the um, uh, passion of God? You know, God has always wanted a people for himself and a people of righteousness. That is why he was working with Israel. But we know that after the Lord Jesus died, he was crucified on the cross. That promise of having a people, you know, that spread to 
many others the gentiles came into the fold in all the nations of the world that's why in the book of revelation you see that people from every tribe every tongue but they're all there they're all there and uh, they are worshiping the lord jesus christ so all these people now together are that holy nation remember that peter talked about he said you are a, a, a royal priesthood a holy nation and that's what god wanted he wanted his own people and what should be the characteristics of this holy people of god righteousness he wants a righteous people he wants a godly people he wants a holy people and why is this earth and uh, uh, why is this earth going to be um, you know renewed through fire because the corruption of sin ultimately through the uh, redemptive work of god all these things are going to take place uh, and even the corrupted earth is going to be renewed okay so god is making everything new and he wants everything to be righteous and uh, god wants to be done away with sin completely and that's the kind of future we are all looking at you know we are looking at the rule and reign of christ and we're all looking at you know a righteous nation a righteous people that is all of us who are saved by the blood of jesus okay now verse 14 he says therefore beloved looking forward to these things so he says come on this is so exciting he's ending his second letter uh, and whenever we end our letters you know we say right or we end our class our course we'll say hey i'm looking forward to meeting all of you whenever you can please come you know to to bangalore things like that so he's excited he's excited um, about the truth that he has just taught and about the people uh, and so he says beloved looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him in peace so he says come on we have this eternal kingdom uh, we have a bright future we are all looking forward for a land where there's going to be righteousness so i'm telling you be diligent remember diligent we said to keep at something or don't give up be doing that because that's the right thing to do be diligent to be found by him or in other words he's simply saying see we are in christ jesus but do you also know you know as the word of god says that seek him and you shall find him so god wants an active pursuit of him you know when as believers we say i already know god and you know it's fine you know i'm very happy with my life and that's it what i know about god till today great i'm very happy with it but we see in the bible god wants us to go after him and remember we said the progression in our faith journey add to your faith of virtue knowledge so we have to keep going higher in god or you may want to say we have to keep going deeper in god or we have to keep going wider understand his love more okay i understood about god's love when i was 16 years old i understood more about god's love when i was 18 years old you know in that manner what's happening wider 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 so my understanding of god is increasing again it's a call to maturity it's a call to a deeper walk with god and say, so he says come on what a life we have what a promise we have what a future we have so why come on, why shouldn't we uh be diligent or careful to be found in him or in him uh, we have to be in christ continuing to pursue him more and more so be found by him and then he says in peace in peace is what obviously he is a god of peace and therefore that is something that uh, fills our lives when we are pursuing him and then he says without spot and blameless that is holiness okay or sinlessness so he says with peace by being sinful and consider that the long suffering of our lord is salvation so he is giving an explanation to the uh, question that the scoffers are asking they are saying 
where is god when is he going to come he said he is coming he is coming it's 2000 years he never came so for that he is giving an answer and he's saying god's long suffering is salvation or he's saying in other words don't you realize god is giving extra time so that more people can hear the gospel more people can be saved you know more people can come into the fold and all that so just because god is waiting it doesn't mean he has forgotten his promise but even in that he's being very kind to us and you know that should make us happy so the the uh, last part of verse 15 as also our beloved brother paul according to the wisdom given to him has written to you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures so now he's making a reference to uh, paul now we have to understand the dynamics between peter and paul uh, initially when um, paul became a believer nobody was ready to accept paul because they thought he's pretending he is an impostor he will come and pretend like he's a christian and he will persecute us so nobody was willing to talk to him and you know we know from what apostle uh, paul says that he spent time with james okay but then you don't really see that he spent a lot of time with anyone else uh, and we also know that once peter uh, peter was rebuked by paul because what happened was peter was uh, in when there were jews he was not eating with the Gentiles. But when the Jews were away, he was eating with the Gentiles. So he was maintaining double standards before the Jews. And uh, Paul did not like it. He said, come on, Peter, make up your mind. If these people are saved, then why are you trying to please the Jews? Okay, you decide whether you want to fellowship with the Gentiles or you don't want to fellowship with the Gentiles. So there is a rebuke also, which Paul had issued. Now, even though all these things had happened between Peter and Paul, you see the respect which Peter carries and he carries respect for Paul even though Paul was not one among the twelve. Okay, so uh, all these things speak a lot about the interaction among leaders and their brotherly love for one another. And he says, beloved brother Paul, so he was happy with Paul by this time and he had seen, understood the ministry of Paul. One more thing he says, he says, see, there are letters which Paul has also written. And what is Peter's occupation? Peter was a fisherman. Whereas what is Paul when it comes to, you know, his uh, education, his work profile and his social standing? He was a scholarly person. He was trained under Gamaliel and he was well versed in uh, the Jewish scriptures. So he says, you know, some things which Paul wrote, it's too difficult to understand. So Peter is being very honest here. He says, uh, speaking of these things some of these things that i'm telling you paul has also written and he says some things are hard to understand so maybe because of the scholarly way in which you know paul put things across it was hard for peter uh, and he also says that there are people or there were people during their times who took the so called mysteries that Paul wrote about and they twisted those mysteries. Don't you think this is so unfortunate that God's word can be twisted? It's very scary. Why would somebody twist God's word? But here is the fact, okay, all Bible college students, as I was, I think I told you in the last class also, we can take any passage of scripture and with the wrong motivation in our heart we can make it sound like what we like for example if i want to um 
you know condemn a poor person i could just uh, take any passage of scripture and say that um, you know uh, god is the god of blessing how come you are not blessed uh, so god said that uh, the lord is my shepherd i will not uh, want you are in need that means something is wrong with you you didn't pray enough or i can twist it the other way i can make it sound like god doesn't like the rich people right so um, it is hard for uh, um, uh, a rich man to enter the, the it is easy for a, a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of god are these verses there in the bible they are there but we know bible college we have studied hermeneutics we have to interpret scripture in the light of scripture so when we look at other passages the bible very clearly says you know that um, uh, even the poor uh, they are rich in in the in the sight of god uh, it says in the book of james we are going to see that we also see that um, you know somebody who is rich wealth and riches are in the house of a blessed man a man who fears the lord so if it is not god's blessing then why why is it that uh, god is giving people wealth and riches there's nothing wrong with wealth and riches so you see i want to say something i can make the scripture say it that is the most dangerous thing that is what peter is talking about he's saying that there are people who take scripture and they twist it to say whatever they want to say now we should not be among those people when we read the bible you know the bible is actually uh, simple in the sense that it is saying one thing our way of understanding the bible is i have to search or study to find out what that what what is god trying to say once i understand what god is trying to say i stick with it simple finished that that is about interpreting scripture so i understood the meaning of it okay so then god is not upset with the poor god is not upset with the rich also but the poor have to uh, behave in a certain way the rich have to behave in a certain way okay great so every time i preach i preach the same thing because the truth can't change my understanding can deepen but the truth remains the same so there is no question of twisting the scriptures but Uh, unfortunately peter says look there are people they take up all these mysteries and things that even paul has written about and they are twisting the scriptures so uh, you know that's really sad and uh, beware of these things okay then he moves on in conclusion he says you therefore beloved you see how many times this is beloved 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 that again shows us the relationship that the apostle had with the people no people were never treated like uh, okay i am going to tell you you do it you know like lords uh, over god's people we've seen that don't lord over god's people but they really have a heart for god's people like this is the bride of christ and here we are preparing the bride for the return of the bridegroom and that is why there is a great sense of respect there's a great sense of love towards god's people and he says therefore beloved since you know this beforehand beware i told us that second peter is a warning it says beware lest you also fall away from your own steadfastness so you see it basically just tells us that there is a possibility for a believer to go away from god and we've discussed this many times uh, so since we know that let's be careful we have to stand strong always pursue after god then being led away with the error of the wicked but grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ so once again he says don't follow these people who are teaching you wrong things but you continue to grow so grow in what in god's empowering in god's knowledge okay and the knowledge about the lord and savior jesus christ to him be the glory both now and forever amen so that was their way of exalting god like let glory be to god and um, you know he closes with amen over there okay now come on let's go to i think let's uh, 
yeah let's go to jude i think we we will be able to do jude so if you could please uh, go in your bibles to jude yes okay what we'll do is now we will quickly read through the book of jude okay and then we will go back and uh, try to explain i'll probably just summarize and not do it verse by verse um but you'll have the whole meaning of what is being said so i want one person or maybe two people to read it full full chapter can anybody do that shall i read it now yes yes dev you can read the whole read the whole thing okay okay huh. jude i'm reading reading from nid Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all interested to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secret, secretly uh, slipped in among you. They are unworthy people who present the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwellings, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, those ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuked you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And, and the very thing they do understand by instinct or irrational animals do. We destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into balance error. They have been destroyed in chorus rebellion. These people are blemished at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest harm. Shepherds, of, shepherds who feed only themselves, they are cloud without rain, blown away by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and up to death. Twice dead, they are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering star, for whom blackest, darkest darkness have been reserved forever. Enoch, the, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy one to, to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are gamblers, fault finders, they follow their own evil desires, they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, be building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to, being, 
to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hitting even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That's a really long passage, but thank you for reading it. And I think it will uh, give us some understanding of what is there in this passage. I'll come back and it's quite easy because it's similar to what we've been saying about apostates and apostasy. So I will uh, share some key points over here and let's see if we can also jump into James today. OK, so let's take a break class 10 o'clock uh, 10. Yeah, 10 o'clock. Come back at 10 o'clock. We'll uh, continue. Thank you.